This morning's uh, State of the Science is how can interdisciplinary research inform our understanding of type 1 diabetes. Thank you all for joining us, distinguished panelists. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules and um, you know, joining us to discuss this, uh, this topic. Um, this series is a, you know, the, a celebration of the power of debate and discussion that women scientists in type 1 diabetes research bring to the table. We have a global audience of scientists here today. And we thank everyone for joining. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. The panelists are going to set the stage for the discussion, and then we ask them to weigh in on, you know, on their thoughts um, on the three, uh, two pressing questions in this arena that we'll share via a poll with the audience, um, the larger audience. So this is sort of like a free-flowing conversation, like sort of like a cross-idea exchange, town hall, and respectful debate. And as I mentioned, we'll have two um, audience engagement polls uh, during the course of the State of the science. Um, if you um, need a few pro tips, you can su to submit a question. You can place in the Q and A, or you can submit questions throughout the presentation. And participants can upvote favorite questions. At the end of the session, we're going to answer as a question as time is allowed. And this event is being recorded live um, on the Sugar Science um, YouTube channel, and will be housed there after for few, uh, further viewing. So in the interest of state, saving most of the time for discussion, I'll do a very brief introduction for each of our scientists. We could actually take up the whole time discussing each of them. They're valued and integral members in the type one diabetes field. Um, and you can connect with them uh, on our website in the CoLab where many of them are, or you can reach out to them directly. So Dr. Carmela uh, Evans Molina, MD, PhD at um, Indiana, uh, University of Indiana. She is the J.O. Ritchie Professor of Medicine she serves as the director of the Indiana Diabetes Research Center, the IDRC, and she's the director of the IDRC Islet and Physiology Core. She's an investigator in the Type 1 Diabetes Trial Net Network, where she sees it, serves as scientific advisor and as chair of the long-term investigative follow-up lift. Um, Dr. Jessica Weaver comes to us from Arizona State University, and her uh, research centers on developing uh, translatable cell-based therapies for the treatment of uh, disease, with a focus on islet transplantation for the treatment of type 1 diabetes. The Weaver Lab uses biomaterials and in immunoengineering approaches with the aim to generate immunosuppression-free transplantation stat uh, strategies. Dr. Kizzy Tang uh, is coming to us from UCSF, where her lab focuses on translating knowledge on mechanisms of immune tolerance into novel therapeutics for treating autoimmune diabetes and preventing transplant rejection. Currently, two major areas of work are on trans uh, therapeutic application of regulatory T cell therapy in type 1 diabetes and transplantation and immune uh, mod modulation to enable immunosuppression free transplant of cell, uh, stem cell derived beta cells for treatment of type 1 diabetes. Dr. Allison Bayer comes to us from uh, DRI Miami, um, the Diabetes Research Institute there. And as reported in the Journal of Immunology, her team uh, established an important function for IL-2, IL-2R for the uh, development of natural Treg cells. This will be an important line of future investigation as polymorphism in the IL-2 IL-2R uh, gene that likely <clears throat> leads to reduced IL-2R signaling is an autoimmune susceptibility gene for both MS, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. And her research focuses on understanding the basic immunobiology uh, of Tregs and applying that knowledge to future um, clinical translation applications. Dr. Julie Snedden comes to us from UCSF. The primary focus of her lab is the niche in pancreatic development and type 1 diabetes. Her research group employs the tools of stem cell biology, developmental biology, genomics, and tissue engineering, and her lab studies the underlying biology of the cellular microenvironment, including the cellular diversity and lineage relationships of the non-epithelial compartment of the pancreas in the context of organic uh, genesis, adult organ function, and disease. Dr. Kate White comes to us from USC in Los Angeles. She's the Gallivan Assistant Professor of Chemistry at USC, and she's a cell biologist, a structural biologist, and a pharmacologist interested in developing experimental methods for 3D visualization of single cells to characterize the cellular ultrastructure uh, to um, mesoscale organization. And she's also interested in helping to develop integrative whole cell modeling infrastructure to harmonize structural and mathematical, mathematical representations of the cell across scales of biology. And uh, she uses beta cell pancreatic beta cell as a model. So distinguished panelists, will you please set the stage for this discussion, which is interdisciplinary uh, approaches. How can interdisciplinary research best inform our understanding of type one diabetes? Um, I'll ask you just to give a little flavor for your work um, and um, then, then sort of make your point. So um, if uh, 
Payne, Dr. Payne would like to take the stage, that would be great. All right, thank you so much, Monica, for, for hosting this discussion and, um, and, and bring up this important topic. Um, I am an immunologist. Um, most of my lab focus on trying to turn off the immune response. Uh, we focus on type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune diseases, and that's where the immune system is the enemy and they cause a disease. So we try to turn them off. And um, so the, the approach we are taking is to use the immune system's own self-control mechanisms, namely regulatory T cells. Um, so they are, they're a small population of cells, but when they go bad or when they are not there, um, the immune system can destroy our body. Um, they are actually patients with defect in congenital defect with regular, regulatory T cells and a very high percentage of them develop type one diabetes. So we know there's a special relationship of this cell type with type one diabetes. And our approach in my lab is trying to use regulatory T cells to therapeutically as a drug to put off the immune response specifically in the pancreatic islets. I think the topic of today's discussion is whether we need interdisciplinary um, collaborations to tackle the disease. I think the answer is a, a definitive yes, right? And when the disease is not just a defective um, immune system, but also an overreactive islet, we have um, appreciate that um, problem. So we need islet biologists to, to teach us about islet biology. Why do they overreact? And how can we treat the islet themselves to help them to calm down? So that's something that's really beyond my expertise and expertise in my lab, but there are plenty of others, um, including those on this panel understand islet biology much better. And when the islets are gone, and when we re need to replacement, uh, replace the, the lost islets, it gets even more complicated, right? Now, now we're introducing a foreign body into the, um, in, uh, a foreign uh, object into the body, and the immune system gets really angry. It's very hard to block that response. And then we need to learn even from other disciplines and then to see how immune system is naturally regulated to, um, to not react to a foreign body. A, an example is pregnancy, right? And, and when the woman becomes pregnant, the fetus is foreign, but th thankfully for, for human uh, species and then, and then for <laughs> all species, it's not rejected and why is that? And then we can learn from uh, others that study placental biology, for example, and um, uh, tolerance, immune tolerance in pregnancies, perhaps we can apply that to um, islet transplantation, beta cell replacement therapy. So those are the two examples. And I'm going to stop here and then hear from others on this panel. That was great. I, thank you for framing that um, and, and sort of showcasing your work. I wondered if Dr. Sned might weigh in. Sure. Thank you so much, Monica, for having us. And thanks to all these wonderful um, women uh, scientists who are panelists with me today. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of our lab focuses on cell replacement therapy as ultimately the idea is to have, the hope is to have it as a cure, not just a treatment, but a cure for diabetes. Um, and I think that we talk a lot in the field now about what the three sort of major outstanding challenges are to really fully realizing cell replacement therapy. Um, for this, the, the high number of people who could in theory benefit from that. And there's three major things I think many of us in the field keep sort of discussing. One is we need to make enough replacement cells and we need to make the right replacement cells. I would even argue that it's probably needs to be an islet, not just cells that we think about building. The second is that we need to ensure that those cells engraft in such a way that um, they exhibit long-term survival and function, of course. And then the third is something very important that, that Tong was just bringing up, which is we need to achieve graft tolerance as well. So I would say all three of these major challenges, which so many of us are working on, on this call, and of course, so many other labs around the world, 
they all will benefit from, and maybe I would even argue require collaborative efforts and cross-disciplinary efforts. And I'm so excited about that because I think that's the that's the way to do the best science and to get us the the farthest the fastest but it's also such a really gratifying way to do science and I think it really enriches all of our lives when we have more perspectives weighing in different approaches that we can take and ways of thinking about things that frankly we just weren't trained to do in our discipline right so I think it's really a wonderful and fun way to do science so just to highlight a few more specific examples for each of those three challenges that I just mentioned you know, we are a developmental and biology, developmental biology and stem cell biology lab. And so in terms of making a lot of the cells and making the right cells, one of the things that we've been really focusing on in our lab from a developmental biology perspective is, gosh, we might not really understand all about how a human eyelid is made in by mother nature in the human. We've been basing, of course, so much um, work in the field and the stem cell field on rodent data. And absolutely that has been critical and all stem cell work, I think, rests on the shoulder of giants in developmental biology. Um, but I think now is the time that we really need to get that last layer of information about how human lineage decisions are made and how human beta cells are actually specified. So that's one of the things we've been working on. And this is a wonderful collaboration between developmental biologists and people who are working on state of the art, really innovative single cell type of genomics approaches to query at a single cell level where these cells come from in the human, um, their lineage relationships and what transcription factors, for example, need to be on or off to make the right cell in the dish from a stem cell. The second challenge, um, this engraftment challenge is also really, really important. And this is an example where there's amazing collaborations with um, transplant surgeons and um, many other types of people who think about um, how do you build the right kind of structure, you know, an islet, let's say, maybe bioengineers and tissue engineers. And that's been a really fun space to explore too, how we can improve engraftment and survival. And then that last piece, of course, looking at the immune system, which is so critical, this is obviously Obviously, a, a very strong collaboration between wonderful immunologists like Tong and others, um, and stem cell biologists and islet biologists and transplant surgeons to really try to figure this out. So I think, I hope I just highlighted a few examples of how this is a field like so many others where cross-disciplinary and collaborative team-based approaches, I think are gonna be critical for really pushing us um, over the finish line, which you know we, we will do, um, but I think it's just uh, also happens to be a wonderfully exciting and really fun way to approach the science too. That was really well said. I love the um, visual of sort of like the extra level um extra layer i guess is because it is it's like the layer cake right i mean there's so many these all these different layers of disciplines that you know need to be sort of synthesized and harmonized together yeah exactly i i like baking so i don't get to do it very often anymore but i like baking a lot so maybe that's why that came to my mind <laughs> i like it it's perfect um okay so how about uh, dr weaver do you want to weigh in and for your uh, perspective Sure. I mean, I think all of the comments made so far are <laughs> very similar to the ones that I would make. Um, so my background is I'm a biomedical engineer. And so for the past almost 15 years, I've been in um, working largely in trying to figure out how to transplant islets to or insulin producing cells to replace the missing cells in type 1 diabetic patients, um, mostly in, in mice and rats. <laughs> I haven't made it to the level of humans yet. Um, but something that I think became really clear early on um, in my journey here was that it's relatively easy to, um, you know, not super easy, but relatively easy to transplant islets and get them to engraft um, as long as you don't have an immune response that you, you know, that barrier that you're battling. Um, and so pretty early on, my focus became um, this, this issue of the immune response, which I think is um, as uh, Dr. Tang alluded to, is compounded even in type one diabetes because you have this pre-established autoimmunity that um, you know when you transplant a cell, uh, an islet cell, the body is already trained to immediately destroy it, and so it's not just fighting this um, uh, you know foreign tissue response, but also battling this pre-existing um, autoimmunity. Um, and so that uh, led me when I established my own lab to try and look at biological examples of, 
you know, what is the best biological example that we, we could mimic to try and hide tissues from the immune system. And so as Dr. Tong mentioned, um, really the only example of that is pregnancy where we have true tolerance against even fully allogeneic tissues. Um, and I think what's fascinating about trying to manipulate the immune system uh, <laughs> at this point in history is that we don't even really fully understand how tolerance is established in these different um, scenarios, whether it's um, you know just uh, general tolerance, we have an idea, but during pregnancy, it's still really kind of a, a black box. And so um, even just last week, a big paper was published that kind of uncovered a new mechanism for how tolerance is established during pregnancy. So it's super exciting to kind of try and be working in this space and modeling a specific um, um, you know, biological example while we're still trying to figure out how it works. And so, yeah, for sure, I think interdisciplinary approaches are necessary. You know, our lab um, works a lot with primary islets, but we certainly recognize that the, the cells we're going to need in the future are um, cell therapy products that are produced from probably stem cells. Um, and so certainly our lab has to work with the, the groups that create the cells that are going to be the ones that we can transplant in the future. And then working, of course, with um, immunologists and now in particular, reproductive immunologists who are really at the, at the forefront of um, figuring out how this tolerance works in pregnancy. Yeah, it, it seems like an ideal model system actually to you know, understand pregnancy and placental tolerance and the like. I feel like it's, it's even though it sounds like it's a frontier, it's a, um, uh, it seems like a natural place to start, to be honest. I mean, it feels like, um, I'm surprised that it hasn't been fully, you know, more fully mined, but um, I'm really glad that you're doing it. So, um, how about from uh, Dr. Bayer? Hi, um, thanks for um, letting me join this call today. I think it's so important to have these discussions. Um, my lab, I'm also an immunologist, and I also study tolerance mechanisms and how we can use our natural immunity and our natural way that the immune system responds or regulates immune responses, and how can we use that to our advantage? So early on, I studied a, a cytokine called IL-2, which is really important for originally we thought for effector T cells, but through this work, we discovered that this cytokine is critically important for T regs. And as Dr. Tong mentioned, is if you have, they go bad or you have a lack of these cells, you know, it leads to systemic autoimmune diseases. So we had a model where we initially tried to study Treg cells as an adoptive therapy and we had a lot of success in that model. So really my work's been focusing on how to re recapitulate this environment that's supported, supportive of Tregs. So we really kind of honed in on really focusing on the environment um, instead of, yes, we know the cells are important, but if we can't get the cells where they need to go, if they don't have homeostatic support, if they can't maintain their function, you know, it doesn't really matter how many of these cells we could potentially give for therapy. So when we're thinking about developing these for patients, I, my lab is really just focused on what is the supportive environment that these cells need. And through this work, we found that we can use um, Treg adaptive therapy, and we can use up to 20-fold less of these cells to get a benefit um, in autoimmune diabetes models, like in the NOD mouse model. So really understanding the environment that supports tolerance mechanisms can really push us forward and really, you know, moving forward to making new therapies for the for this clinical situation. And when we think about um, pregnancy, I think also that is a great area to understand. And my lab also has been in more recent years looking at natural killer cells. And this really came out of my studies of looking at Tregs and IL-2 because there's this interplay between natural killer cells, Tregs and IL-2, and they both compete for IL-2. So when you change the Treg environment, you can get this unleashing of inflammatory NK cells. But what I so find so interesting when we think about pregnancy, natural killer cells, Tregs are very important in these environments. But the one thing that struck me about the NK cells is they actually have also a non immunological based role in pregnancy, which is they take the trophoblast when you need to 
increase vasculature in the placenta as the baby grows and demands more nutrients, more blood flow. NK cells actually piggyback, piggyback these trophoblasts and help line new vessels. And if that fails, then you can have miscarriages and other things. So you can have babies that are born too small. Um, so it's very interesting to think of a, a cell we think of primarily for the immune system. It's actually very important in the developmental biology of the placenta. So what other roles can Treads or other cells be doing that are outside the box of what we normally think of? So I think it's absolutely critical that we have these different disciplines coming in um, and really working together. So that's kind of my experience um, with therapies and eyelid transplantation. And then the last point I want to make is, I think the clinical trials we've had thus far in T1B, monotherapies are not going to get us to where we need to be, even just to reverse diabetes or prevent diabetes. So it's really these combination therapies. And the only way we're going to get there is really to work um, as team science, because monotherapies are just not going to be sufficient to get um, clinical benefit. So that's it. But yeah. Thank you. No, that's great. It's a great um, summary. And I also liked the, the whole shout out to the idea of, um, you know, one and done, it ain't going to do it because it is, you know, kind of just, um, it's a heter very heterogeneous disease to start out with. And so it's probably going to take this sort of heterogeneous approach, you know, uh, multi, multi-step approach. Um, I wondered if um, Kate, uh, Dr. White might um, speak for a moment and sort of outline her thoughts. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join this. This is uh, a really fun event. So my, my background is in structural biology um, and pretty hardcore structural biology. So I focused on protein structure for a really long time and learned a lot of lessons on how we can use structural information as a basis for design, whether that be drug design or new tool design that can be used to probe, probe biology, or or whether that be even you know a, de a design tool for for a potential different kind of therapy. And I, I started getting really interested in really trying to apply this sort of structure based fun function relationships to more complex systems. So now my lab is completely focused on really trying to understand how a beta cell actually secretes insulin and what goes wrong in disease from a completely structural standpoint. So we are developing new tools for high resolution cellular mapping at the single cell level. So we can really map out where all the organelles are, where they move, um, who they're in contact with. There's this whole new kind of area in cell biology of trying to map out interorganelle contacts that seem to really modulate important functions for, for just basic cell biology. So our big question is really how does the cell kind of move and reorganize itself during as it's responding to its environment to secrete insulin and um, really trying to relate that structural information to, to some of the to basic functions of the cell. So a lot of our questions are driven kind of in basic biology, but there's a lot that we still don't know about just basically how a cell functions. Um, and in, in diving into these kinds of experiments, I got very, very interested in you know, not only you know, generating new tools for, for imaging purposes, but also using new tools for computational modeling. So the idea here is to really try and relate the structural data to the functional data. And a lot of times that functional information is really different. So we might have mathematical models that represent metabolism or protein signaling networks, or you know, maybe a, even a drug response for, to, for trying to protect beta cells. And how can, you know, so really we're interested in trying to relate this data to what a bunch of other folks are working on. So that in itself is inherently interdisciplinary. So I think for me, it's a really easy question to say, I, you know, I don't think we can, I think most of the big questions in biology now are really at the, the interface of multiple disciplines. So um, for me, it's, it's really, that's an easy question, I, I think. It's important for really trying to understand disease, but it's also really important for just trying to understand basic function. Um, and I, I will mention that for a lot of our modeling efforts, one of the things that we 
have been trying to work on. And one of the things that I've really been working on in the last few years is figuring out how we can make data from different disciplines accessible to those other disciplines. So as a structural biologist, a lot of people outside of that field don't really understand what we're doing and why, because it isn't accessible. It, it's these crazy looking maps that are hard to understand if you're not in the field. So what we've, what we've really been um, working on is, is really how to make our data accessible to others, how to even um, really get other fields to engage with us and think with us on a lot of these uh, um, challenges. And in doing this, I, I kind of started an, an international um, consortium called the Pancreatic Beta Cell Consortium while I was a postdoc to really help focus on a lot of these questions. And one of the interesting things that kind of came out of that group is I started collaborating with digital media artists at the USC Cinematic uh, Arts School. And we kind of taught them a lot of basic cell biology and beta cell biology. And in doing that, it really helped teach us how we should maybe be interacting with our other scientific um, collaborators. And I think uh, that was for me was a, a really a great lesson. Um, and as someone who's relatively new to the diabetes field and to the beta cell field, um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be able to try and bring new technologies for, for really trying to integrate data from different fields together uh, to really understand holistically how these systems are working together. Well said. Yeah, I think, um... I think I've seen the um, I've been to the to the USC uh, beta cell presentation. It was really phenomenal. I think this whole idea of inviting others into your realm is so important. It's hard. I think it's hard to get out of your lane sometimes when you're when you're focused because you have to be super focused to to get your deep levels of work done. And I think, but it's it's almost like you have to sort of like, you know chew gum and ride the bike or whatever you want to call it. You have to do two things at once and well, and it's really, it's challenging. Um, what do you, I guess I'd, I'd ask the whole panel, what's your impression, you know, um, of the different, you know, I mean, there's obviously different scientific languages being spoken in the type one diabetes field. What's your impression about, what are the best, some best ways to try to, to bring these forward? I mean, the, the you know, the, the pancreatic beta cell consortium is, is one idea. Um, the NPOD meetings seems to be very diverse and, and, and inclusive. Um, and then there's like the T1D knowledge base down in UC San Diego, where they're trying to create a genetic repository. Um, what, do, what do people think about, you know, best ways forward to really bring, um, you know, bring the different disciplines together? Um, I think one thing that um, I find First off, I think collaborations, the best fruitful collaborations happen organically. So that happens when we get a chance to talk like this or be at meetings. And I find what's really helpful is when you have these workshops that are sponsored maybe by the NIH or the JDRF, where you have kind of an overall topic, but you have bioengineers or immunologists and geneticists, you know, and structural biologists all coming together to present their work. And we can really start seeing how we can interconnect these disciplines to help each other's research. So I find, you know, the I love the NPOD meeting and all, and all those other avenues you mentioned, but I also think these workshops that organically bring people together, and I think people will just communicate and and have a spark of interest of how we can help each other in our in our areas of expertise. So that's that's my these workshops I find very very good. Yes, feel free to dive in. Okay, um, I was going to just echo something that Allison said, and also Kate. Um, you know, this idea of communication and what what is the most effective way to communicate? I guess cross disciplines, and maybe you're also asking Monica with the public too. And I think these are such important questions. Um, I just I just zoomed into my daughter's third grade science class yesterday, and uh, it was so amazing because they wrote thank you notes already, which was so sweet. It's like I'm going to save them forever. <laughs> but it was so interesting because they were these lovely little thank you notes that each wrote and said what what they learned, and it was so interesting to have that feedback as to 
what they got, you know, came away from the discussion with. And I was going to say something sort of similar, which is that I think sometimes you need to try out different modes of communication to figure out which ones are most effective. And then getting the feedback back, though, is really important because you can have an idea of how that went. <laughs> um, but it's really important to have the sort of bi-directional feedback. But another thing I was going to say is that going off of what um, Allison was mentioning about conferences being so important, I wonder what everyone else thinks on the panel. I enjoy many types of conferences, obviously, and I think we're all still a bit starved for in-person interactions, but um, I really appreciate in particular and value, I think there's been a trend towards um, maybe having a bit more of trainee talks at some of these national conferences. They, they have to then be a bit shorter or everyone's has to be a bit shorter and it's kind of the news you can use, highlights kind of real, but I think that's really um, especially effective not just for giving trainees a chance to give talks, which is so important, um, but to sort of force all of us to really condense it to, you know, what is the, the high, in a way, what is the high level contribution of this work? And then you get to see a much wider panel of what people are doing. And I think that fosters collaboration, in my opinion, perhaps more effectively than having many fewer, but just very long, sort of very detailed talks. So, I would push for you know a continued trend in that direction towards, for some reason you know having trainees do it often it, it turns out really well because they do a very good job crafting their talks and they also they are the seeds in a lot of ways of collaboration right because they're sort of making a lot of these connections and talking to one another, so that's a piece I think that is great and I hope will you know continue when we all can get back to more in person conferences. That's an excellent point, and I love that idea. You know, sort of like sort of hitting the high notes and then if people want if people hear something that strikes a chord with them then they have that opportunity to reach out to the individual scientist for more information or read their papers and then reach out yeah. but it is good to get more i think just more more voices out there and a diversity of voices um because you know i mean it's great to have the kols out there giving their um, their, their detailed information, but I do think that there's a real benefit of getting, um, getting, a more, more of a landscape view. Yeah. Cause there's, there's so much going on, right? I yeah. mean, there's such a volume of science and, and depth too, but it, there's such a range of science. And if we only have, you know, it's a zero sum game usually with how much time you have. And so I think getting a little bit more of a wider sampling these days is, is, is really, really helpful because then you get to learn about stuff that people like, you know, here are doing and, and foster those collaborations that you're asking about, so. I love that. Can I, I follow on a question? I, first of all, thank you all for those introductory comments. They were outstanding and, and I think really framed the discussion so nicely. Um, and I, I agree completely with your emphasis on shorter talks and trainees. And it's something we've talked a lot about in the MPOD planning. Um, and so it's really nice to hear that sentiment echoed. One thing that struck me um, at our most recent MPOD meeting, which was in person um, uh, for, for a couple of days, was I had several trainees say that was one of the first in-person things they've been able to go to in their entire career as PhD students, which was um, kind of shocking, but it, I think it just sort of highlights where we've been with the pandemic. So. Now, just kind of thinking about a comment that Allison had about workshops and really diving into a topic, is there something based on this panel and this discussion that you would say, let's build a build a time uh, at, at an MPOD meeting or an IDS meeting or, or something similar where we want to talk about this topic? Um, and so what would you think would be a topic that could bring a group like this together that we might um, have a discussion around? That's a great question. Well, I think our, we keep going back to reproductive immunology, right? So that would be great because it, it, it automatically will bring in all of these different disciplines um, to study develop, developmental biology. How is the immune system protecting baby? And what other just avenues go into setting up that tolerant state um, and allowing the baby to continue to flourish? So I think that's like a perfect topic I was so happy when when Monica had this as a topic um, to discuss because I do think it's a very underappreciated area where we could really make um, leaps and bounds because our body's already doing it so we just need to learn how it's doing it and then figure out ways as scientists how we can then apply so I think reproductive immunology is um, you know 
a perfect opportunity to bring um, a, a good workshop. And there are even, you know, scientists at Stanford and um, at Harvard who are really, they're, try they're trying to figure out how to even make an artificial placenta. That would be, that would be cool if they could also be there to weigh in. You know, like I said, yeah. case cells kind of blow my mind. They have this very important role, non-immunological role in the placenta. If you don't get the increase in vasculature as the baby's demand um, needs, you know, bad things can happen to the child. So um, just, you know, if there has to be other things that are going on that are just gonna completely blow, blow our mind of like what's going on in that environment. I'm all about the environment. So I definitely think understanding that environment in the placenta is really important. Yeah, on that note, I think there's another environment that's extremely immunosuppressive that we come to realize, which is the tu tumor microenvironment. If we can bring in tumor immunologists and then really those who are studying cold tumor, meaning the tumor doesn't have immune system in it. Those are the tumor that's hardest to treat. And then that may give us some clues in how to keep immune system out of the eyelids. And I think there's not enough um, communication between the tumor immunology and also transplant immunology. Yeah, another great consortia build. <laughs> um, how about from the structural side, you know, Kate, um, like how can you get more, you know, chemists and structural biologists to interface? Could you build a repository? I mean, how could you do it? Yeah, actually, um, you bring up a great point, and that is one of the things that we're working on is um, really developing um, uh, basically open science kind of approaches to allow other structural biologists or other imagers that are doing kind of similar work as we are to, to have a place where they can deposit data. So that really pulls off of these other fields that have developed their own databases, like there's a cryo-EM database, there's, um, for, for, especially for individual proteins, there's a protein data bank. So we're really trying to learn lessons from how they have already done that. And then basically um, ha have a system to interface directly with that to try and pull all of the data that's required for really trying to understand data cell biology together. Um, so that's, I think, at least one way to help folks contribute their data, even if they don't necessarily want to dive into maybe some of the actual biology questions that we have, but it still is a great way to get that data kind of more accessible. Um, and then, you know, the more that we on our side try to make our information accessible to folks like you, um, I think that kind of helps as well. Uh, but it's, I guess, you know, I think. I think kind of the more that we sort of talk about these um, maybe underdeveloped areas in research that as a group, as a group like this, kind of the better because it helps us even identify ourselves what like really what are the big kind of areas that there, there are for discovery still. Um, and that's, I think that is generally helpful. Kate, when you think about these kinds of exciting repositories and sort of building databases across disciplines, which is such an exciting idea, this is kind of a naive question, but is there is there a role for things like you know um, you know AI basically or machine learning to try to extract some types of meaningful features across yeah types of data or is that just not possible right now? Uh, I mean, it's something we talk about a lot, and there I mean there are a lot of other groups trying to do this kind of work too. So a lot of people are interested in having these data repositories that are available to others, but. Um, it, certainly as we move forward, I mean, I don't think this is something we can really do right now at this current moment, but as we're moving forward, we are keeping that in mind um, because there are, there has to be patterns between, you know, these different data sets that are meaningful and important, and we just don't know to look for it yet. Right. So there, there certainly is rationale for, for trying to use something like machine learning to help us find these patterns, but it, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a big chore, certainly. But I, I think it is worth considering. And I, I think working with folks kind of in that field is, is relevant. Um, I, so we have talked a lot with folks at IBM Research on, on these kind of big picture topics and really trying to, at least at this point, 
trying to do what we can to innate once the technology, you know, once the machine learning technologies really get there, we'll have our data ready for it. Um, that's that's kind of what we're trying to do. It it slowly, but that that is what we're keeping in mind. Yes. Well, there is another woman scientist. Um, she came out of MIT. Her name is Katharina Baltz, and she just yesterday the there was a news release that her company has just she's a she's in a J and J incubator now in New York City, but she, her company's just raised six million. And her company's called Occam's Razor, right? Occam's Razor is like a physics thing can be true, but uh, uh, her name is Katharina Boltz and she's she, her focus is Parkinson's. And this is exactly what she's done is she's taken data sets and layered them. The phenome, the cellular cell bio data, the genome data, you know, and medical records. And she's, and she's using the, that paradigm to mine these layers of data back to you, Julie, as, uh, and, and um, to pull out, you know, uh, contextual, um, you know, things that were missed before. So it's a really fascinating company. And I mean, it could be a great model system for type one, I think. Yeah, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Kate. I, I was just gonna say, I think that's fantastic because it's, we're certainly missing things that we don't know to look for. I mean, if, if that wasn't the case, we would, this problem would be solved. So I, that's exciting to hear about. So I was just going to add to that is, um, you know, bioinformatics, I think as Pete, maybe it's changed, you know, I just turned 51. So maybe it's changed a little bit, but I don't remember getting a lot of exposure as either a graduate student or trainee, or even early on in my career about bioinformatics. And it's really something that you have to kind of dive in and, and learn on your own by, by, forming collaborations and looking, especially as the technologies pro, how do we take these big data sets and really get meaningful and bio, you know, and able to answer biological questions and then how to layer these on top of other disciplines, I think is, is you know, we're not necessarily taught that. So maybe workshops that include some bioinformatics. Um, and so we can start thinking about how we can relate our data to each other, I think would would be helpful too, especially as there's younger people and not so younger people <laughs> within the audience. Yeah, well, I'm mean, the Sugar Science together with DK Net. We ran a D challenge and we asked, you know, we put out these data sets to the community, and you know, we had 58 participants. They came in, they mined the data, and they came up with these novel hypotheses. You know, not just judged by us either. It was like judged by some you know, the the T2 and T1 knowledge base people and Ben Busby from DNA Nexus. So they were like experts judging what they came up with. And they and 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 the DKNet people sort of like taught them how to how to wade in, although they were many of them were younger and they already knew how to wade into these data. But so, so we're gonna do another one, but this is an opportunity for people to kind of like get their feet wet and understand, like, okay, I we can go back into the literature and like look through some of these data and see what we come up with. But you're right, I think it is um, again, it's another wheelhouse of information that you have to kind of um, try to learn <laughs> exactly um i yeah, want to oh sorry go ahead yeah i'll just piggyback off of that and say that i you know i find myself as a pi now constantly wading into spaces that i have no training in um and big data is one of those spaces where you know, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what are the, you know, immunomodulatory secretions of these cells. So let me send off a sample to proteomics and now I have no idea what to do with the data. <laughs> so it comes back to the, the need for interdisciplinary approaches and, and needing collaborations in these um, relatively, well, it seems to me new spaces because I also did not get any um, training in this area when I was, you know, going through school. And so, um, yeah, definitely, especially as we get more and more information and more and more data. We need people who can, um, yeah, help me, help me at least. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Data. Um, yeah, or just like a friend you could, you know, reach out to and, uh, and get, the, get the feedback from within your network, professional network. So I'm gonna launch poll one and hopefully this will be of interest to people. It's mm -hmm. um, what um, interdisciplinary research has the most chance of informing our understanding of type one diabetes multiple choice. Um, can, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so let's see what we have to say. 
the answers are grass for graft versus host disease, placental biology, cancer research, immunology, developmental biology, and a computational bi uh, bio like that being done at USC, all of the above. And I feel like we touched on every single one of these. So. <laughs> all of the above. So <laughs> just getting some answers. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, I think it really does just getting back to that layered approach, the layered approach, and then coupled with some of these new powerful data mining tools might be really exciting. Um, yeah, interesting. Put one more minute till we get at least 50% of people weighing in. Um, if, you've got, if you're out there listening, please don't be shy. That's enough. Oh, 50%. Some people have. Here's the, here are the results. So basically, if we share the results, it looks like all the above is, is out there, but also placental biology and immunology, no surprise. Um, does anyone want to just sort of comment on that? I think is that immunology is so complex just on it on its own on our own as uh, Dr. Tang said. I mean, we have innate immunity, we have adaptive immunity, we have the underlying autoimmunity, we have transplant rejection, you know, going on in the islet transplant setting, and we still don't even have a good understanding of the interplay. We know the innate needs to happen in order for the adaptive to happen, and but we don't really understand the interrelationships of the cells. I think that's still lacking. And even from t rib biology point of view is we don't really even understand how the t regs when they are applied and we see therapeutic benefit, how is it changing the micro, you know, the microenvironment? How's the landscape changing? Are we getting less M1s, more M2s? What's happening to dendritic cells? What's happening to these other inflammatory cells? We really just don't even understand from a t reg based approach of how the Tregs actually change the landscape. So there's so many questions just in immunology. So I totally agree. Just different disciplines within um, immunology is, is, is key as well. Yeah, I, I think the, the answer is we need the more knowledge, the better. And as Jessica said, and as a PI, not as scientists, we have to constantly evolve ourselves and expand our knowledge, but there's a limitation, right? And then there's so many different expertise um, out there, and then we can reach out and then expand our network of expertise. And, and then those conferences, and we've talked about, are going to be extremely important. I found the conferences are really good at sparking new ideas and wanting to collaborations, but I don't know actually how many of those actually happen, the percentage. And then that's where I think we need platform. We will have the seeds, but we need the soil as well to, to get these ideas to germinate and to grow and really to become fruitful. And then that's where I think the, the infrastructure and I'm going to raise the, the F word, the funding, and then will, re, will be really important following these kind of uh, um, um, conferences to catalyze new ideas and collaborations and then really to foster these new ideas by um, forming consortiums and fundings. And, and sometimes it's maybe we don't even need to, uh, or it's even better to, than individual collaborations just by chance. Right, and it's really to build platforms. I have a pile of proteomic data myself, and I don't know what to do <laughs> with it. But maybe perhaps Jessica and I can both reach out to a, um, I don't know, um, NIH-sponsored proteomic um, um, task force or some sort, right? And then can help solve these issues. We can't be experts in everything, mm -hmm. but we need everything to be able to tackle this disease. Yeah. I also, I loved how you said that you need the platform, you have the seeds, but you need the soil. I mean, it is interesting that um, type one, you know, it, there is a little bit of a, of a, a shift happening, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like type one is too big to be a rare disease. And yet it's being a little bit eclipsed by uh, almost as a business case by 
type two because that market is getting so big. So then, you know, what funding and what you know what interest by by the larger um, comp industry is is going to come to it. So it's it's a little bit. I don't know if you feel this way. I'd love to hear your impression. But how can um, how can we strengthen it by by getting this interdisciplinary nexus going to 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 really strengthen it and showcase that how um, how that kind of operation can can strengthen the whole field and, and really bring it out um, as a as an example for for others who are kind of like a little bit you know in between days. Does that make sense? I should answer this question and give her input because I think NPOD has been so successful of having these, having these different working groups, the virus group, and, and everyone just working together and sharing information. So how did NPOD do it? How has it been? I mean, I know NPOD has now been around for plus 10 years, and I'm sure it didn't work as smoothly in the beginning as it does now, but I'd love to hear her input. Yeah. How did NPOD do it? So I, I think, um, you know, I have come on a, in leadership and input in sort of like, I guess, maybe the third funding cycle. So I, I can't claim the success of all the, um, of Mark and Alberto who worked, you know, really it's been a passion project for so many um, to make it so special. And I think it is quite special in the field. I, I think some of the themes that um, make it more interdisciplinary than, I, than, than probably other venues is really attention to how we structure the meeting and having a lot of discussion time at the meeting. Um, and then also there's a lot that goes on when people request tissues. Um, they may not have experience in, um, in type one diabetes even, but want, want to ask a question using the tissue. So there's, or they might um, you know, have sort of limited uh, collaborations within the field. So there's a lot that happens uh, at the tissue prioritization committee to say, oh, that's a really great question. Um, have you ever thought of asking this additional question or working with this person who's asking this question? Or let us give you some guidance on how you can best use the tissues. So I think that um, we very much value um, the organ donors and the families of the organ donors who've been gifted this incredible resource to the community. We wanna make sure that we're being very good stewards of those gifts. So. Um, so I think there's a lot that happens. Um, I saw Sarah Richardson was attending. She's on our TPC, just you know, has amazing input um, on that committee, as do many others. And then the working groups, I think, um, sort of creating a venue for for space and time for people to be together from different groups. Again, I think back to your first point about kind of having the question and building the people around that question, and then giving them a venue to discuss it. So I think those are probably the three biggest elements that have made MPOD um, this important um, kind of resource for the community, not only from the tissue perspective, but I think also the scientific discussion as well. Yeah, it's a great, um, it's a great example for how to do things right, I think. Um, okay, I'm gonna launch one more poll. We're getting towards the end of our time, it goes by so fast. How can interdisciplinary research be invited and encouraged to collaborate with T1D researchers and projects? Financial incentives and directives from NIH, financial incentives from JDRF and et cetera, other funding operations, organic out, outreach driven by scientists, digital platforms or hubs, in-person meetings, other. So Monica, while this question is percolating, can I, can I pose one final question to the uh, to the panelists, I, and it's been alluded to several of the comments. So, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking with my trail net hat at the moment and how we, um, we, we sort of face the complexity of designing clinical trials that involve both adults and, and children and, you know, probably very different disease um, endotypes that bring those people to the clinical trial space. But if you could, I, I heard combination therapies, which, you know, we 100%, um, you know, agree with moving in that direction. But if you could tomorrow start a clinical trial, what would it be in this area? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That's a great question. Well, I have a favorite one. My paper last year came out with anti-CD3 and antigen-specific Tregs. So combining anti-CD3, which already has this known safety profile and recapitulates the environment that I found in my studies to be important to support Tregs and then coming in with the right Tregs. Um, you know, I love that idea of 
immunomodulation before you give the right kind of Treg. Now, whether anti-CD3 will be the magic bullet or it needs to be anti-CD3 with something else or another drug altogether, I think is still an open um, question, but I definitely feel like immunomodulation where you're impacting the T cell compartment before you give Tregs is, is a really critical approach to, to try in the clinical setting. Thank you. I don't know, uh, Dr. Tang, do you have any, any thoughts? Or Dr. Weaver, have you, have you thought about this question? What would you like to see as trial and clinical therapies? I, I like Allison's idea. I also worked on anti-CD3 and, and currently working on Treg. And then the, the, you know, we need to work again as a team to, to think about how to design that type of trial and then what patient population to go into, right? And then we learned a lot in the anti-CD3 um, therapeutic development, and then um, we're building Tregs and how do we combine them? It will take a team to, to launch that idea. I like that idea a lot. Me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I also like, yeah, I also like Allison's idea. I actually, my, my son had a false positive autoantibody test um, this year, and that was a, <laughs> a pretty scary. As someone who's worked in type one diabetes for so long, um, you know, it just put me in a very different position, different hat than I normally wear. And so I, I looked a lot into the anti CD three, and and you know, was starting to ask uh, if there was going to be another arm to because I think they had um, kind of low numbers and needed uh, bigger numbers for the FDA to. Um, to consider. So yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be interested as someone who was actively looking for clinical trials for a minute there. I'd, I'd be very interested in the, you know, the study that Allison proposed for sure. There's a collaboration right now. It just was born. Um, so for poll two, basically financial incentives from JDRF and other funding entities uh, can really encourage collaboration. So that's the, that's the most popular answer. And I think you know, those kind of financial incentives go a long way towards getting people to really come together from different, from across the, the um, you know, across the globe. So um, I guess, um, you know, I, I think we have like three minutes left. I wondered, um, what are your thoughts to sort of just, how, how can the prodrome be approached from an interdisciplinary you know, state. I mean, you've got Dr. Evans Blina has, you know, you've got a, a large experience, a long history of experience in the clinical trial space. You know, what what do you think will um, will it take to dissect the prodrome uh, of type one? You know, maybe we even just define it as young kids or teen kids or whatever you want, whatever window you want. What what disciplines need to participate there? Well, um, I think that. Um... You know, one of the things that we do often when we're thinking about how we're going to in intervene in the disease is when we have an idea, we, because it's easy to identify people in stage three when they are diagnosed with type one, um, many things get tried there. And we have this um, very sort of practical hesitation to, to test out new ideas in autoantibody positive people because they're difficult to find. They're sort of a very limited pool of individuals. So I think, you know, this idea of how do we um, take all this great science, but then public with, or partner with public health um, experts to think about population-based screening um, or how we identify a larger pool of people who are at risk both to, to perform clinical trials or then also to, to potentially treat and intervene in the disease process. So that is, that is, I think, probably what I think is the next barrier for how we can, you know, if you think about, I have this timeline and talks that I give, and it's been 30 years of immunomodulatory therapies, but the first anti-CD3 NOD studies were in the early 1990s mm. it took forever to get to the point where we may have one disease modifying therapy. So how do we shorten that cycle um, to be able to do this in a faster uh, throughput way? It's, it's, it's really a very daunting thing. So I think we've got to figure out how we identify people at risk um, so that we might you know, have different interventions for them. Yeah. And, you know, a company like Prevention Bio, I think, has their, their finger in that right now. They're trying to really identify uh, who are the best candidates, right, for their type of um, therapy. But if we, uh, you know, we're going to, this is definitely not going to be one size fit all. Um, well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, we don't have any questions, I guess, from the audience. I don't see any in the chat. Last call for questions. 
Anybody at all? Okay, very quiet day today. Um, and I thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. It was really interesting. And um, just from a personal uh, point of view, this is this today marks uh, nine years of my own daughter having type one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I just um, am so appreciative of all that you do um, in the laboratory and in the clinic. It's, uh, it's amazing. And I know you're working as hard as you can to push the ball forward. So thank you again.